Welcome to another edition of Odyssey House Journals, a podcast about addiction and recovery. I'm Randall Carlisle, and my co-host is the internationally famous Rachel Santizo. You're too kind, Randall. Thank you. No, did you? I've got to tell you, we can do analytics on these podcasts, and we actually have viewers and listeners in uh, our biggest country right now is I think we have eight people in Russia. Uh, there's one there's one listener in Iran, of all places, uh, several in Switzerland and Sweden. Uh, so you didn't know that, did you? I did not, but that's exciting. Ooh, well, I, and I, I figured the, the people in Russia, they're, they're, they've been drinking cheap vodka for too long. And so they're, they're thinking about recovery or something like that. So. Let's hope that's what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, so we are in temporary surroundings because of COVID. We're going to have a new studio as soon as this stupid COVID thing goes away. But did you know I found a positive aspect of COVID-19, if that's possible? Do tell. This is from the Partnership to End Addiction, and they claim that it may be reducing risk factors for youth substance use because teens are spending more time at home with family and away from their peers. Time spent with peers who engage in unhealthy behaviors is one of the strongest risk factors for substance use with teens. Also, remote learning may reduce stress and anxiety for some teens, uh, who feel academic and social pressure at school, and it has alleviated sleep deprivation caused by early school start times, which is another factor for substance use. You believe That's that? incredible. It's well, interesting because I think with the adult population, it's gotten worse, but if we can address the teens and, and get there, then I think that that's fantastic. And that well, makes me happy because COVID is definitely challenging. Well, there's something positive about <laughs> this whole stupid thing. We should tell you, we are available to watch on YouTube or listen to on iTunes, Spotify, or iHeart. And if you, if you catch one of our podcasts, if you subscribe, every time we have a new one, it'll notify you. Now, we have a very important and rather famous in the recovery community guest, who is a doctor who I met through you. So I'll give you the, the introduction here. Thank you, Randall. Today is definitely, we are very lucky to have Dean Mayer is, gonna, is on our podcast today and he's the director at Riverton Medical Center. And he also created a PIC program through Intermountain Healthcare where I work closely alongside him. And he's gonna have a lot of things that we need to hear um, and I'm, I'm so excited for him to, to tell a point of view from the doctor's perspective. And so without further ado, Dean Mayer. There, there I am, coming Magically. on. It's a pleasure to be here, Randall and Rachel, and I appreciate so much you guys having me on. Ted, maybe for... I mean, Rachel assumes, and you obviously know about it, and I do too, the PIC program. Maybe you guys could outline what that is and why it's so important to the recovery community. Sure. Let's, uh, let's first define what PIC is for those that Perfect. don't know it. PIC stands for Peripherally Inserted Central Catheter, and that is an IV catheter, so a catheter that goes into a vein, and we utilize this peripherally inserted catheter as a extended, um, to, to provide extended course of antibiotics uh, for patients who need it. Um, you know, a lot of times we treat um, patients with infections with antibiotics that are either, you know, by pill form and then sometimes short-term antibiotics in the hospital. But there are conditions that are really serious and life-threatening that uh, require prolonged antibiotics through an IV form, which is a much more efficient way of getting antibiotics to a infected source of the body. How would drug um, use cause the problems that require the antibiotics? Great question. So um, the drug use that we are seeing is injectable forms that create uh, bacteria that live on our skin to actually enter into the body through the bloodstream. And those are serious infections when we call it bacteremia, which is bacteria that gets into the bloodstream and it, it circulates within the system and it can land on uh, parts of the body that sometimes are uh, either diseased or injured in some way or just 
are friendly to uh, bacteria to seed on them. Um, two places that are really dangerous, Randall and Rachel, uh, are the heart valves uh, and also the spine. And those can cause such serious um, consequences. Of course, uh, with heart valve infections, it can lead to heart failure. And also when these bacteria seed on the heart valves, they actually um, create through the circulation, these pieces of the bacteria that, that go into the circulation and seed other places um, through the circulatory system. So we're talking about IV drug use. Right? Correct, yes. Right. What are yes. some of the challenges and barriers? Like how did this come about for you? So I think when we talk about drug misuse in the populations and the less vulnerable, we're gonna think homeless, the streets, the incarcerated, but now the hospitals, you get to bring light to that perspective. Yeah. Yeah, Rachel, as you know, we, we started to see this real increase in, um, in admissions into the hospital back in 2014. And the data suggests that we really started to see an uptick in heroin use and methamphetamine use about that time. The real challenge is when patients come into the hospital um, sick with infections, and we've identified them as injecting and misusing these drugs um, and having blood-borne infections that the biggest challenge I'll tell you was trying to manage their withdrawals. Of course, um, methamphetamine withdrawals are easy because people aren't getting their methamphetamine so they sleep for three days. <laughs> and so they're easy. But when you withdraw from a substance that really kind of relaxes the system like opiates, heroin, uh, and now we're looking at fentanyl as a big one. Um, the withdrawal is severe agitation, irritability, and the behaviors that come from that uh, really uh, detract from our ability to treat the medical condition and the infection because what happens is they have the need for the drug so badly and we didn't recognize those withdrawals. We were very uneducated with it. And so patients would leave and they would leave against medical advice without getting the treatment that they needed. And so the evolution of our education on how to recognize it and then treat it um, promptly has created a better means of keeping patients in the hospital to fully evaluate and treat appropriately and stabilize. Well, let's talk about, I'm just gonna say, let's just call it the white coat stigma. Mm -hmm. So when you have individuals in there, um, how they feel towards doctors or individuals in, in white coats, how have you addressed that or changed that with your patients? Because I don't think that you fit into that category at all. I think we got to realize that, um, you know, most of us in the medical community that wear a white coat, for instance, or other providers, we're not in that same situation. So we don't understand. And when you don't understand, you can't put yourself in their, in their position. Um, and so I think there's a mistrust and a sense that, uh, that we in the medical side of it judge them. We judge them. We don't look at them as a person that needs help. Um, and I think that creates such a barrier. And so, uh, you know, my approach has always been to um, tell them I don't understand, but I... Um, am sensitive to what they're going through um, and to really communicate to them that, um, you know, the judgment doesn't mean that I think they're a bad person, but yet they bring some unique things to um, the medical arena that we have to understand together. And our goal is not to, um, to punish them for that, but to help them get through it. And it's a long course. This is, you know, the infection piece is a very short course. As I've told our team many times, don't lose the forest for the trees. And the trees, the small part is their infection. The big part is the addiction. And if people are really committed to sobriety and getting that treated and not having to come back with heart valve infections and, and spinal infections and abscesses and this terrible experience sometimes in the hospital for judgments that, you know, to be honest with you, are sometimes true. Um, that we can 
mobilize that to moving them into the big picture of treating the addiction while we finish the treatment of the infection. Which, and you've come up with a program to do that, that sort of, that involves Odyssey House and or maybe other treatment programs as well. But so how did that, so you've got somebody in the hospital, uh, uh, a substance use disorder person with an eye, with a pick line in to treat an infection. Uh, and so that's fairly stable, but they need to continue the pick line, but they need to work on the, on the substance use issue. So, so how did you work? What, what did you come up with? Yeah, so Randall, we, you know, I looked at this uh, in the sense of, of resourcing. So when you look at all comers, all patients, our goal is always in a hospital, you treat their acute infection or their acute problem, it could be anything. Um, and once they're stabilized, we move them into home or into a resource of getting rehab, like uh, they need physical rehab if, for instance, they've had a stroke. Uh, or they're debilitated because of weakness and they need some type of nursing and therapies that, that uh, are, are easy to move into the communities, right? Um, but the fear uh, of having one of these long IV catheters in that, that basically get inserted into the upper arm and they track right next to the heart and provide that long-term uh, option for antibiotics. If you send these people out into the community, some are homeless or into situations where they can utilize that pick line for injection, we saw lots of morbidity and mortality, meaning lots of complications and the worst of which is death. They overdose easily with a pick line in place. And so we needed to look for a safe discharge, a safe place for them to go to get their antibiotics and clearly in their situations, it, it wasn't home, it wasn't in a shelter, uh, it wasn't even in these nursing facilities that would provide it because it was easy for them to have visitation and, and uh, people that would come in and bring them drugs. So our response was, we just kept them in the hospital for weeks. And it does drain the medical system to keep them in the hospital when they've already had their acute needs met and we're treating them differently. Um, and so I really sought out looking for programs and um, places pe people could go like this that could get the care they needed to complete, but also focus on the addiction piece, which is the huge piece that <laughs> You, you're not really helping them. You can treat an infection and then send them out and, and you've done nothing. You, you've got them through one piece of their life. Uh, but the big picture is you have to treat the disease that's really brought them to that life-threatening situation. And then sending them out is, again, another life-threatening day by day. So we have, you know, to, to, to have identified Places like Odyssey House that provide that treatment of the addiction has been critical to this program. So we actually have we have people coming from the hospital into a program like Odyssey House with a pick line in. Uh, and Rachel, what was it when you when you worked out this program? What were the obstacles to bringing somebody in with a pick line into our into our treatment program? Um, there's a lot of medical that, that needs to be taken care of, um, and they, they need to be treated different. So when they come into Odyssey, they're a part of the community, um, but they also have some different needs at, that need to be addressed. So it's been a learning curve for everyone um, involved. But I think really, to me, it was, it was more an opportunity so when I heard about it, it was because I was like, wait a second, I like to inject. My drug of choice was heroin. I could easily be in that bed. I've actually personally had a pick line. Like it, it's like this unforgotten space or just hasn't been looked at or hasn't come about. And Dean brought that about. Um, and so bringing that population and serving them as well, it's more of an opportunity. So no matter where anybody is, we can meet them where they're at and give them that opportunity. And so actually that it's more of an opportunity hands down than because, concerns. 
because before this, before we worked out this program, we I, I don't think any treatment facilities took people in with pick lines, did they? You know, take out the take the out the IV drug use piece, and um, many of the facilities, Randall, take uh, patients with pick lines right uh, to finish their care. But you add that piece to it, which is a highly dangerous situation to put them out in the community. One of the misconceptions has uh, has been and, and continues to be that that a place like Odyssey is a medical facility as well. That that is untrue. So. We, we are essentially sending them to a home situation. And so the medical care that we provide is through our home care. And so we send nurses and therapists and people that do wound care, for instance, um, to Odyssey uh, and provide them that care in that home situation. Right, and it is more than just the pick line um, because they can come in with abscesses, wound backs, like they have other things, I remember, uh, and he was actually on the show, but one of my, my greatest experiences was meeting a gentleman that took a shotgun to his stomach and then ended up on a pick line. And he's, he actually, I just spoke to him and he's got 19 months of sobriety. Wow. Um, and so there's a lot more that comes into play and it is that addiction piece, the stuff that comes along with addiction. So have we had a, a lot of clients come in or, or, and how's it worked out? Uh, you know, before, uh, Randall, before we developed this program in 2018, when we had the ability to transition patients to Odyssey or other facilities, uh, our success rate of treating the infections, less than 10%. Whoa. Less than 10%. That, and, and a lot of that was because patients would leave early. They were withdrawing and they needed to get to their substance. And we just, again, were not good at it. We didn't recognize, we didn't help them. Um, now we have a means. Uh, and now with the program, we've improved our success rate to almost 50%. <laughs> now, in, in, and I'll tell you in medical terminology, medical means, if you just take, you know, 49, 50%, you're saying, you're not very good. You need to find a different way. But when you go from less than 10% to 50%, uh, that's a huge success. Um, Realize though that it's not just our success, it's, it's a patient success. And I think that, that has to translate into a lifelong situation. I mean, look at Rachel. She's a huge success. Pick line or not, she is a huge success. And look at her and how effective she is with these people. Um, and our program, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, but, you know, part of the 50% of, and I hate to say failure, because that makes people feel terrible, but our inability to be successful sometimes is dependent on the patient and the person's ability to say, I'm ready. I'm ready to take on the addiction. I'm ready to go through the steps that need to be taken while my medical team is taking care of me. And, and people don't, people don't realize that I mean, you, you're never cured. I mean, because I'm a recovering alcoholic. Rachel is a recovering addict, and and you're never cured because it's a complicated, lifelong disease, and right. it's something you know. So, uh, I'd say fifty percent in the program is is really significant because you're absolutely right. When we get people into our program, and you can tell from the onset that they really don't want to get better. That they had to come because their their probation officer made them, or the courts did, or whatever, and they don't want to get better. They're not going to succeed. Right. So, you and know. you know, for the short term, that's okay, but we want to be able to provide them with, um, I think, connection with people that have been successful. So maybe it puts something in their mind that says, "I can do this, but not now." And you hope that in the time between them recognizing that and when they're ready, that something bad doesn't happen. And in those cases, I think, Randall, it's okay to treat their infection to move them to the next step. Um, Odyssey happens to be a very strict program. And so the community here knows that it's, it's strict. And so, uh, you know, across the board, there are some that just aren't ready and they don't want to go to Odyssey. 
they feel like it's jail. It's terrible. It's like, well, it's because you're not ready. And so we, we are looking to, and we're contracting with um, programs that are less strict so that you see a, um, you give patients choices. You give these people choices. I don't care if they're homeless. I don't care if they're uh, unfunded. We will find that for them because there are, there are expansions of government services like Medicaid, and we call it grant funding, that provide the funding for these patients to get the care they need, and, both and, from an addiction standpoint and from a medical standpoint. And, and many times you'll have people, I, I, we have people that go through our program, what, three, four, five times, or, you know, and, and you're right, it, it just takes, you got to be ready. Yep. It's, yeah. the same, it's the same with this PIC program too. We have names that come through. It's just, it's the nature of the disease. Um, and I think even if we get them treatment services, regardless of where it is, I think the, the critical points is one, Dr. Mayer, just caring. I remember pre-COVID, we would actually go meet with the clients, have lunch with them, check in with them. Um, meet in person? In, in, wow, that's an old concept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that, Randall? <laughs> yeah. great concept. Yes. And so go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I think that is so funny. I didn't know if you meant because of COVID or because a doctor would come to the facility and actually hang out with them. <laughs> so I was laughing at both. Wow. Either way. Um, but it's that connection and just saying, hey, we see you and we care about you. And it's also providing those resources like, oh, you're not alone. And you, these, these different areas. And then that way, if they do come back, they know that they can still have the opportunity, right? Depending on how they left or, you know, there's always some things that come into play, but sometimes it's just that planting the seed. That hospital bed can be that opportunity to maybe learn about uh, Vivitrol, uh, methadone, Suboxone, or the options. I think that like Hep C treatment, a lot of individuals that come in because the IV drug use also have hepatitis C. Right. So even just planting the seed that you matter and you have options, is a huge success on taking uh, uh, this critical, these critical sweet people and creating change within them and allowing that space for them to feel like they, they deserve to change. Yeah. Doctor, let me ask you personally, why did you get in, why did you choose to get involved in this? You didn't have to. It, it just came to me when, when I heard an infectious disease specialist say to me, and my medical team, when there was a patient that needed, um, you know, prolonged antibiotic care, that they were not going to follow this patient if they went to a skilled nursing facility. And you can understand from their standpoint, they know it will likely be a failure and that the risk of death or problems sending somebody to a nursing facility where dealers and other people can bring drugs in that can be injected into their pick line. So, I am. I was totally on board with them, but then it motivated me to say, "This is a big hole in our medical treatment, and a program needed to be set up." And it was okay back then to keep them in house, but it cost um, sometimes patient and staff morale, and it costs financially. Um, and and so to help the system move into a more efficient and effective way of treating these uh, patients, um, it, it, was a, it was a labor of love. It was, uh, you know, seeing the end point, which we're still working on. We, there are definitely, there's so many moving parts, Randall and, and Rachel, that um, you've got to try to perfect each part in the transition. Um, and it goes from hospital handing it off to, you know, social workers and home health and, and the facilities. So um, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and, uh, you know, any of these patients that are willing to commit to themselves in sobriety, we are, we are there for them. There, there's, it, God love you for what you came up with because you, you're, you're saving an awful lot of lives and you're putting people back on path. Uh, you know, in their, in their life. Uh, and, and I think over the last, I don't know, maybe this is just a, an erroneous observation on my part, but I think as, as the years go by, we are looking with less and less judgment on somebody who is addicted to a substance or has a, a problem like that and recognizing that, that it is a disease. 
I, I uh, totally agree. I mean, there are, it's funny, Randall, when I treat uh, patients who come in with um, alcohol intoxication or withdrawals, how is that any different? Because the one thing, the one question you always ask is, does this run in your family? Why do we ask that question? Because there's a genetic predisposition to it that people have a, a, a uh, an inner sense and an inner need for something to be um, that 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 brings something to their to their physical presence, right? It, it gives them something. And all it takes is one time. All it takes sometimes is one time that they take that drink or that um, they inject or they snort or whatever it is that they do, um, that all of a sudden the body says, I like it, I need it, I want more of it. The saddest <laughs> cases, well, Lots of them are sad cases, Randall. I, everybody's unique. But I see a lot of young people that um, have been effectively moving in life um, and they go through an injury. And that injury leads to either a surgery or a need for pain medications, for instance. And, and they're given pain medications. And then all of a sudden their physician decides, I'm done, I'm not treating you, I'm not giving, I'm not your drug dealer. Um, and that has led to so much of the addiction piece, I think, because their body got used to it, they needed it. And so how do they get it? Um, they can go to an ER and they can get labeled as a drug seeker, or they can go on the street and find something really cheap and get treated. And those are sad cases because we failed them. We failed them as a medical community. And that's what we have to fix too. It's not just helping this person, but we have to fix the medical community and how we uh, manage chronic pain and recognize that there could be underlying addiction um, potential. And IHC has done a, a, a really good job on reducing the number of prescriptions for, yes, for yes. pain meds. Yeah. But again, reducing number of prescriptions doesn't mean cutting somebody off. Right. It means finding a means to taper. That is really important. Um, and I think that'll reduce these, uh, the risks as well. But this ruins lives, Randall. It, it, it causes people to lose jobs and family and, and homes, and they end up unfunded and, and, on, and homeless. And these are really um, great people. And, and people that can be um, uh, really add to society in themselves, whatever they want to do. Well, uh, would you believe that our, our half hour is up already? Doesn't it go fast? Wow, it sure does. <laughs> I, I've enjoyed it. I, I, you know, this is, again, this has become a passion. Uh, I love the success, um, mostly in seeing people that are um, improving themselves and, and um, getting away from a um, life-threatening situation for themselves and something that makes them feel good by getting away from it. Rachel, you told me before I met Dean, you said you're gonna love this guy because you said you love this guy and, and I can see, see why, because you have done, you have done so much uh, to, to help the community that we deal with every day. So. So thank you so much for being on this, uh, Rachel. Any last words? And Dean, it's just been nothing short of a pleasure working with you. So I met you as a doctor and I remember sitting at that big table that we would sit at weekly and I didn't understand the lingo. I didn't understand what was going on. I was just a person that had a story. And now I can text you and tell you all the things that's going on in my life and you respond back. And so you've made a huge difference in my life. And so I was just telling him this morning that I just need to watch a movie and eat really dirty food. <laughs> so, <laughs> like this is the type of man that you are. And so it is such an honor to bring you on this show. Um, just tell your story and your part. Um, and for the other people that need to hear that, I'm just incredibly grateful for you. Thanks, Rachel. I, I, I love the message. I, I, uh, I'm humbled. Um, we have a lot more work to do. Um, and, and we got to get away from the judgments that come with all of this. 
homelessness, addictions, um, and self um, injuring behaviors because people need help and we can give them help. We have to understand it. And um, we don't have to be in their shoes to understand it. We just have to have compassion. Mm. Well yeah. said, Dean. For Rachel, for Dean and myself, thank you for watching Odyssey House Journals. Bye.